Um, I'm up here, obviously, instead of Troy. Troy's usually up here. Troy's on vacation for two weeks, so I end up teaching, seems like, every six months. So from around Christmas and then sometime around here. So I'm going to teach this week. Troy's been doing the Revelation churches. This is going to be a departure from that. We're going over Corinthians 13. It's like the love chapter, so it's going to be like different than, than Revelation a little bit. Uh, and then Brandon's going to teach next week. And so one of the most important things is that I get this done faster than Brandon would get it done because he got uh, pounded on for preaching really long last time. So and I don't know when my clock starts, James. Does it start at the beginning of testimonies or, or now? It's going to be shorter than Eddie's, I promise. <laughs> okay, all right, good. Eddie set the record. Eddie's here, by the way. Eddie's here. Hey, Eddie. <laughs> oh, so Eddie was an elder here and has been here a long time. And so if you haven't recognized Eddie, that's who Eddie is. He's in Oklahoma now, but we still love him, and he comes here sometimes. So. Oh, yeah, there you go. Come back. Yeah, come, oh, you come back, but just don't preach, right? On, on Sunday. Yeah. To other people that have long patience. Yeah, yeah, really Anybody else have any other criticisms that we could provide for Eddie before we get there? Oh. So, okay, all right, all right. Uh, so Corinthians 13. Okay, I'm getting a text from a handyman. That's not helpful. Um, let's not talk to you right now. Corinthians 13. Oh, wow. Louder. Nice. Uh, love chapter. You often hear it in weddings. Even if you haven't been a believer, you usually hear it. Hey, love, this is, if, if Corinthians 13 is that love is patient, love is kind. It ends up on Hallmark cards. It ends up in your, at Hobby Lobby's makes a lot of money off of this chapter. And, and then we get it in a lot of weddings, believers and unbelievers alike. So even an unbeliever is going to be pretty excited about this passage and they're going to want it as a part of maybe their wedding. Uh, it invokes a lot of mushy, warm, fuzzy emotions, uh, but there's way more to it also. And that's what uh, my hope is that uh, we're able to meditate a little bit on it. There's only like 13 verses there. I'm not even sure I'm going to get to all of them, to be honest. Uh, but we want to, to slow down a little bit and, and kind of unpack it, pick it apart. There's no actual commands in it, but if you want to turn there, that's where we're, where we're at today. Uh, so since there's no commands, we're just going to try to learn what we can gather from it and see what we can apply. So before we uh, get too deep, though, it's pretty important that whatever it is you're studying, you look at the context. So this is a chapter that was super important to me. It's about love. And so I, I, I memorized it in order to learn more and to apply uh, love in my life better. Uh, and so when I thought, okay, I'll teach on this, it was something I, I thought, okay, I'm comfortable with. But then when I looked at the context, it's actually sandwiched between two chapters entirely about spiritual gifts. And so it's probably, you know... Not Troy's first choice that I'm sitting here going to navigate in between spiritual gifts while he's not here, but, but, but that's what the context is, and so that's what we're, we're going to look at this briefly, uh, and, and uh, it is a chapter, it's mostly, it is about love, uh, but, but uh, it's, uh, it's in between two chapters about spiritual gifts, and that's what the context is. So verse 29, and this, this uh, chapter 12, Corinthians chapter 12, earlier in this chapter is uh, that famous uh, analogy that we often cling to, which is we're actually part of a body. And so uh, Miss Amy's an arm, and Katie's an eye, and uh, James is an ear. Uh, so James is red hair. Uh, but 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 to, so that's early. It's saying that hey, we all have different roles. We all have different parts that we uh, that are all important to the body. Uh, this verse says, hey, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Well, I, I don't know any here and here that can do all those things, and I don't. I think he's he just got done talking about how we all have different roles and we all do different things. So I, the obvious answer to this is no, we don't all do these things. So we, we shouldn't be expecting to do all these things. But the last verse of the chapter does say this: it says, "But earnestly desire higher gifts." And so I, I'm not maybe a spiritual gift guru, and nor am I going to try to be or tell you how to do everything. But I can tell you we are to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And so if we're not doing that, try to figure out what does that look like? How are we, how are you earnestly desiring spiritual gifts? But that said, he's got some uh, guardrails he's going to put on. The Corinthian church is actually kind of a mess. If you read earlier on, there a lot of guys doing a lot of stuff, and uh, but they're still part of the church, which is encouraging in a sense, but it's also an impressive book to read because uh, they're kind of a train wreck. But they also really like to be spiritual, and they like to use spiritual gifts, and I find that kind of interesting. Um, 
But he's, so he pauses here, and at the end of the last part of this verse, he says, I'm going to show you a still more excellent way. And then it goes into Corinthians 13, which we're familiar with. Love is patient, love is kind, and all these things are in there. The last verse of Corinthians 13, spoiler alert, spoiler alert says, uh, uh, the greatest of these is love. And so, uh, in summary, the end of 12 is saying, hey, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And then you go through the entirety of 13, and at the end of 13, it says, hey, the greatest of these is love. And so, the excellent way is love. And so, I think at minimum, it's telling us we're going to have to have love in order to execute these spiritual gifts. But I think it also could be just telling us that, hey, love is more important than the spiritual gifts altogether. And Troy's uh, service on these uh, uh, recent sermons on the churches, do you remember what was being encouraged? Like, hey, we encourage you for this. We, we chasten you for this. Notice a lot of those elements were, uh, were not around, hey, you didn't use... Uh, tongues enough, or you, you know, you, you, you're, you're healing a whole lot, and so I was impressed with that. And you guys are prophesying like champs, and so uh, is often there was a, a common element of love in there. Hey, you forgot your first love; you need to go back to your love. There was a constant theme of him hitting them on love, and so anyway, I, I think it is appropriate that the greatest of these is love. So we want to be a providence, really good at loving. So we're going to dig through this chapter and see how we can do that. But we got to touch on spiritual gifts while we do so. So we'll go ahead and dive into verse uh, 1 through 3 of 13. And uh, I'm, I'm titling this little chunk, Loveless Life is Lousy. Loveless Life is Lousy. And it says, uh, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And it says, if I have prophetic powers so as to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but I have, and, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, then I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and I give up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And so, what we learn is that even if we're capable of doing all these impressive things that we usually gravitate to and say, that is the pinnacle, that's what we want. We can even do that the wrong way. So even if you're pulling that off somehow, which not too many of us are, uh, it, how we do it and, and why we do it is actually more important than what we're, what we're actually doing. And this shouldn't be a surprise. If you've read the Gospels, what does Jesus tell us like in the Sermon on the Mount? He's like continually telling us it's the heart that matters. He's like, you know, you guys are all looking at the outside, but I'm actually looking at the inside. And so, uh, so once again, God, God cares about how we do things as much or more than, uh, than what it is we're doing sometimes. And I'm going to submit that from verse 1, which we're going to look at a little bit more deep, it's not just like if we do it the wrong way, it's like, oh, well, we just didn't get that right. There's actually a harmful element if we don't do it the right way. So today, we're going to look for warning flags to make sure we're not doing these gifts the wrong way because we do not want to be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So the message title, if you get the little bulletin thing, says don't be a gong, and we're going to try to not be a gong. Uh, so how do we not be a gong? Well, it says, hey, if you don't do these things in love, then you're like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So uh, unless you just really, really love your two-year-old, almost everyone else on the planet cannot stand just racket noise. And, uh, you know, it, we're at Stein's house. He's got a piano in his living room. And uh, I don't know if Jones Road's, Jones Road's group is... Uh, we like have different water in our, there's 20 kids at our group. There's more kids than adults at our group. And so like half of those are under 10 years old. And so it's inevitable we have someone, fortunately not during the worship time where we do better than that, but someone will make their way to the piano and you get the dang, dang, dang. And if you're talking to somebody, it's like, it's off putting. It is like, oh, you know, you want to go outside. I can't even continue this conversation. Uh, and I contrast that with some weeks, David Coronado, who's actually, he's not here, but he's, really talented, he'll hop on there and it sounds great. And it's just, people will pay for that environment where there's music going on and you can continue your conversation. This is just, has nothing to do with Stein's piano. I'm just giving the contrast of like, what love, the difference in the way these two things are done. If you do this gift in love, it's gonna come across uh, as a benefit. And if it's not, it's actually off-putting. It's tone deaf, it's like nails on a chalkboard. We want nothing to do with it. So we do not wanna be a gong, we do not wanna be, uh, Nails on a chalkboard. So how do we do that? I'm gonna, so we, say, we know we need to do it in love, but that's kind of a generic thing. It's like, okay, how do I do that in love? I'm going to add one other guardrail. So our, that's one guardrail for today. The other guardrail is in Corinthians 14, verse 12. So if you want to go there real quick. 
I'm just going to use that. There's probably a lot of others we could do, but I only have so much time, so this is what we're going to do. 14.12. So, again, the Corinthians were kind of a messy church, but they loved spiritual gifts, and they were using them as creating some chaos, and you have to read these two chapters to kind of figure out how he kind of clarifies the best way to do these things. At least it seems like chaos to me. I mean, you can read them for yourself and, and take away, but that's the feeling I get. He's saying, hey, sow with yourself, since you guys are eager for a manifestation of the Spirit, which isn't a bad thing. He told us to eagerly seek after gifts, but he says, you guys are eager for a manifestation of the Spirit. He says, make sure you do this. He says, strive to excel in building up the church. And there's other verses too that we just don't have time to go to. But the point is these spiritual gifts are given by God to us. It's not something you go find and you create in yourself. You're not going to go become a Jedi master and have all of them. And like God has certain gifts for us and we're going to go, uh, you know, he, he will give those to us, but they are for the purpose. And he made that purpose and he gave us the gift to build up the church. And so that's our second guardrail. We're going to try to do these things in love. And then we're going to try to make sure that it's building up the church. You, you can ask yourself, what are some good reasons that these should be our guardrails whenever we're, we're considering spiritual gifts? That they're done in love and that they're building up the church. You're going to come across as a gong. It's, it can be very off-putting. Notice it doesn't say that you, you, see, you don't search these things out so that you can have this personal experience. And I, I keep hearing this over and over time where a lot of times we're seeking for this mountaintop experience and it's almost as though you're just trying to, it's for yourself and for closeness. Now these things come, don't get me wrong. If we're loving well and we're seeking things of the spirit, it's gonna happen. But remember to look at the purpose and what's happening. It's supposed to be loving towards others and building up the church. That's the purpose of these things. So anyway, those are our two guardrails. I'm going to use those two. We're going to go through this list, list of spiritual gifts real quickly in these first three verses. And we're going to look for flags that kind of tell us, hey, we're headed on the wrong path. So if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I'm like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So speaking in tongues... In some groups, uh, in a, I guess, couple I've known in the past, I didn't realize it at the time whenever I was younger, uh, a couple went to church and it was uh, multiple families were getting together and uh, speaking in tongues was being used as a litmus test for whether you're a Christian or have the Holy Spirit at all. And there's a line of thought out there that's saying, hey, if you uh, don't, can't speak in tongues, then that's, you know, you're probably not filled with the spirit and that's not really that's not what the gospel says we just got done reading corinthians 12 right what did it say is everybody an apostle does everybody work miracles does everybody no not everybody does that so what's the risk of that is that done in love no that's not a loving thing does it build up the church no what happens is you create second class citizens you have the people that are experts and they they are the jedi masters and you have everybody else who's, who's not or worse you're saying hey you're not even saved if you can't exhibit this particular gift and that's not uh that's not scriptural so um whenever i think of tongues there's a verse that i think of i'm going to pull it up go phone go hold on uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5.2. It just says, hey, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Is this specifically talking about tongues? No. It's just an encouragement to me to say, hey, just make sure you know, we, you know, wh what we say matters and remember our, you know, our position. It's not about... Uh, showing off or an experience that I'm trying to have. We're just trying to make sure that everything we have is uh, a choice word. So anyway, that, that'd be tongues. Uh, verse 2, if I have prophetic powers to, so as to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I'm not going to try to define prophecy. I think there's a, lot, a couple different things on what prophecy. When I think of what prophecy is, I think of Old Testament, right? We got Old Testament prophets, and they say, this is going to happen, and then it would happen. And then the false prophets would say, hey, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. That, that's my broad generalization of prophecy that I see in the Old Testament. And then... Uh, Troy likes to remind us that, hey, if you're a false prophet in the Old Testament, then uh, they, don't, they don't take too kindly to that. They'll knock your head off. And now we don't, we don't have that today. Today we're kind of like, oh, we, just, we, we like fortune telling and we think it's interesting when people are predicting things. But we want to look at this briefly and say, hey, what does it look like 
How do we not be a gong? How do we play in the game of prophecy without being a gong? And uh, the only observation I'll have, I'm not going to tell everybody how to do this because I don't even, but, but I can say that if somebody's telling us, and, and Troy was talking about, there's a group out there that says, hey, 20 to 80% of our prophecies are, are coming true, so we think we've got an understanding of how this is going. And uh, while I find that interesting, and part of me wants to know what they've got going on and whether they'll like tell me what the score of the next game is so I can make some money off of it just out of mere curiosity, if we use our two guardrails, is it loving? Does it build up the church? I have to ask myself, in what world do we live in where a false prophecy could possibly be loving or could it build up the church? And so, and my answer is I, I, I can't think of one, so I'm not going to condemn. I'm just saying from my observation, if I'm using these two guardrails, I don't understand how false prophecy is loving or it's building up the church. So that would be a flag for me. And I'd say, hey, let's not be a gong. It kind of is a turnoff when, when you're hitting and missing prophecies. So uh, if I have all faith, so has to remove mountains. This one's interesting. Uh, I think, again, how do we do this loving? How do we build up the church? The verse that kind of comes to mind is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And I think there's a school of thought and there's a teaching out there that says, oh, I'm going to use that verse. It's kind of as though I'm going to do all things through Christ. As long as Christ is on the board, I can pull off basically whatever I'm trying to pull off. I think a more right understanding of that verse is I can do all things through Christ, underlining Christ, that strengthens me. So basically it's Christ that's doing everything. I'm kind of just along for the ride. So this is... It seems like semantics, but it's a big stinking deal. Those are two totally different worldviews. There's one that's like, I'm gonna, I, I can do it, I can do it. And one is like, hey, Christ is gonna do it, I'm gonna just do it with them. Does that make sense? Uh, I think it's important to realize that sometimes we're being taught our words are powerful and our faith is powerful. And if you can drum up enough faith, faith can do something for you. But like faith is only as strong as its object is what uh, you know was told, uh, what, what I'd heard at one point and I thought it was good. So I have faith in this chair. If this chair is busted, what's gonna happen? My butt's gonna hit the floor. So like it's only as strong as the, is the chair itself. So you can have all the faith you want, but it's not gonna change what's actually gonna occur. Now if the chair is good and I have faith in the chair, it's, it's gonna work out for itself. But I think it's important for us to realize that uh, faith Sometimes I feel like it's being taught is we have faith in faith. And if you have faith in faith, that's circular. That's not doing anything. And you're like, well, hey, the verse says, if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains. I almost think that's a tongue-in-cheek statement. What does Jesus say about faith required to move a mountain? Does anybody remember? If you have faith as a what? Mustard seed. How big is your mustard It's tiny. She's basically screaming at you saying, hey, look, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you're going to move a mountain. Why is that? Because we don't participate very much. The amount of faith that's required is this. We don't need to be Superman heroes in order to pull that off. It's like, we just need this, and it's Christ that's going to actually move the mountain. And so... Uh, so anyway, all that to say, how could this... Why is this a warning flag? If you have faith in faith, instead of faith in Christ, can you see how that would not be loving? It won't work out for you. You can have tons of faith if something that's super important to you and you're telling somebody all about it and you can have strong faith, but it's kind of man-centered and then when it crashes and burns, you look like a fool and everybody else thinks God looks like a fool. And so, and then, yeah, anyway, that, that's how, that's my, my take on the, our risk of going that direction with faith so as to remove a mountain. Uh, healing, you know, we had... Uh, videos showing, I, I, it's really disappointing, but it's showing that Benny Hinn video where somebody with a really obvious uh, issue, I don't remember what it was, was walking to the front and then there was some, it showed the video, the person directing that person one direction because it had a very really obvious injury that may or may not be healed up on stage. And so they were trying to kind of just say, no, no, no. And they were bringing other ones up that weren't as obvious or weren't as physical. And that, uh, I kind of knew that was happening, but it really pricked my heart when I saw that occur because it's like, man, this is sad. So, because you saw the people with major, major visible issues kind of moved over here to the side, waiting in time out when they brought up people with more psychosomatic sort of things saying, oh, we're healing you. And they're putting on a show. And that was frustrating and upsetting. All that to say, if we do healing without love and if it's not trying to build up the church, then obviously we're like a noisy gong. It's off-putting, and that's offensive to people that are looking at Christianity. We need to be careful. And then uh, if I give all that I have to the poor, 
Oh, that's the, that verse three. If I give away all that I have and I give my body to be burned, uh, then I gain nothing. I may not have time to go through all these, but I'll do for, for giving away all that you have. Just giving away all that you have and having a Mother Teresa complex will not necessarily be loving. It may not demonstrate love, and it may not build up the church. And I'll, you know, I think an example I could give. I had a friend that was telling me about in the past he had this idea uh, before he came to Christ uh, about hey, if, if everybody took. What would be? We associate a worldview out there that says that more things are fair, the more things are equal. That equals goodness, and we almost take that, and that's our new definition of goodness instead of saying what what God thinks is good. And there's a risk of doing that, is to the point of saying, hey, if we took everything everybody had and we threw it in one big pile, it would be fair and right and good, and we get rid of inequality if we chopped all that up and everybody took off what their portion was. And as a kid, I might have thought the same thing and been like, well, yeah, that's going to fair, that'd make things fair, and we're all fair. But, but then he was quickly uh, kind of corrected by somebody who said, hey, how, uh, and he's convinced this is what would be good, this would be right, and that's what God would want, love, fairness, you know, don't, why wouldn't God want this? But he, he's just asked the question, how long in our world do you think it would take until you had a, a small chunk of people that rose way up to the top? and a large chunk of people that would kind of work their way back to the bottom. Like, how many years do you think it would take? How often do you, how long do you think it would take where people were, and the, and the reality is you'd have people just jump right back to the top, right? And you have people that get trounced on below. And, and there's different reasons why that is. The people that would be doing really well, it's not that they're all just this greedy, greedy. Yeah, some of them are greedy and some of them are, uh, some of them were just wise with their money. Some of them worked really hard. And the ones down below, some of them were foolish with their money. And then some of them were just, you know, whatever, didn't take advantage of opportunities or miss the boat or, but, but, but these things would just happen. All this to say is this exercise could occur and just the mere giving and reallocating resources is not the defin definition of love. And some of us have, are tempted to have a worldview that that equals love. The closer we get to that, the more loving we are. And I just want to point out that that's not necessarily loving. All right, so uh, long summary short, really long summary long. Love, uh, at the end of Revelation, I mean, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, it's important that we get this right. Because what does he say? There's people coming to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not? And then the, the things that he says, prophesy in your name, which is a gift, cast out many demons, and do many works in your name. Well, these are the things that this is exactly almost verbatim saying. And what was Jesus' response? If you can remember, it was... Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness, or some combination of those three things. And so, like, it is possible to do all these things and not just be like, oh, well, we, we didn't quite do it the right way. It's like, that, that's God's response if we're doing this the wrong way. We come across as a noisy gong. It's worse than just silence. It's like off-putting, and it's off-putting to God. So anyway, that was more, when I picked this to go through, I wasn't planning to go through spiritual gifts, but this is the first three verses, and so this is what we got. We went through spiritual gifts. This is the part of it I wanted to get to, is God's, God defines love, verses four through seven. God defines love. And this is the part we're most familiar with, is love is patient, love is kind. So God defines love, not us, not culture, and it's important that we figure out what it is. The greatest commandment, that supplants the others is what? Love the Lord and then love your neighbor, right? And so we need to know what love is or we're not going to do that well. And so I can't, you know, I'm an engineer, or was, and uh, we have this tendency of trying to peg everything. We're like, okay, well, this is, God is love, and, and then this over here is this. And so therefore, and you start trying to, uh, and, and look, that's not a terrible exercise, but I, it, it, I think it's going to miss the point because it's like uh, describing Describing a sunset or a rose, you just can't do it with words or peg it. You cannot, you're not going to peg this thing in. And so, and, and for that, he gives a long list here. He, he, love is patient, love is kind. Well, which is it? Is it patient or is it kind? Well, it's both. And then you keep going down the list. It's like it's all these different things. And so it's a concept or a picture. There's another list that we're not going through today, but it's the gift of this, uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And notice that it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. I, this was recent revelation to me. This was like, oh, the fruits of the Spirit. Look at all these different fruits. And it's the fruit singular of the Spirit is what? Starts, well, starts with love. And it's like comma, joy, peace, patience. And that, so that's a picture. 
That's a picture of what love is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and then that, those are all the adjectives that describe love. And so if you were for somehow dry, drawing a picture of what love looked like using those words, love, peace, patience, it's going to look real similar to this. And so, surprise, the Bible's real consistent when it's talking about love. It's a little different, but... Uh, Love is patient, love is kind. And I'll go ahead and read it. it says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. Love uh, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And yours probably says different stuff. The ESV is the one I've is the version that, that I was going through. But if you take that and you painted a picture with that, it's going to look kind of similar to the fruit of the Spirit, is it not? And, um, and so anyway, this is, th these are God's definitions of love. He has a lot of words. Uh, part, part of our challenge is, is that our words, uh, our language is lame. As I studied it, I figured out it's like, we use the same word love for like chili dog as we do like I love my wife. And so you can say, I love chili dogs, and you can say, I love my wife, and people will nod at both statements, like, yeah. And they're totally different concepts, or totally different, uh, totally, and, and, uh, and so with that, it, it confuses things a little bit, I've, I've learned. Uh, the Greek, I guess there were three words. They had uh, eros, which is like uh, essential. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a word for sex. Uh, so in that way, you can love. Uh, or it, that might even be just the food, right? Because it's a sense. You're like, hey, I love how this tastes. And so and that's, that's eros. That word's actually not in the Bible. This is a word Greeks use to describe love. Another word that they'll use is, I think it was phileo or something like this. And it's the start of that word Philadelphia that we're familiar with is what, is what people say. And the idea there is brotherly love. That was used more commonly in, Greek, in, in the Greek literature. And it's used some in the Bible. And then the least one in, was agape, that was this third word, that had, and I'm probably saying it wrong, but it was this unconditional love, and it was a special type of love. So that, that, that's how, uh, at least in the, their language, it was split up to where it was meaningful. So for us, when God talks about it, he's talking about this agape love that he's defining. And so we're going to go through these, but before we go through them, I guess we'll go ahead and go through it. Does everybody have... Uh, verse 4 through 7 on a Bible or on their phone or something. We'll do a, a quick exercise. So I, we'll grab, we'll grab the person next to you. I'm going to pause for about 90 seconds. And so find someone around you and then have your Bible. And then you're going to read to the person next to you. Instead of saying, uh, love is patient, love is kind, I want you to read, that person's name is patient, that person's name is kind. And then I want that person to then repeat that back to you. So this should take maybe a minute. I'd like you to read it to that person and that person read it back to you real quick. But so go ahead and find somebody. It might take you a second to find, but if you can, try to find someone. If you can't, that's okay too. Bo, you can read it to yourself if you have to. Okay. So it's interesting. Uh, sometimes you can read through this and just plow through it. And then other times, if you personalize it, it, it I don't know, it comes to life more. It's like, right? It's like, oh, love is a concept. Okay, yeah, love in general is good. Jesus is love. God, Jesus did a great job doing all that love. But is there any reason we should not be able to be inserted into these? And I, I think... Uh, the answer is no. If we're using, you know, if we're in God, walking with God, we should be able to, there's nothing we can't do. God wants us and expects us to, to be able to do this. So I guess I'd ask when, uh, and it's also interesting, it, like, 
which of those did you feel like there's a big gap for yourself? And then it's also kind of interesting, you know, did, did, you, did your significant other, whoever was reading, did they laugh at any one? I saw several people laughing at different people at different times. It's like, uh, it's almost hard to say. It's like, no, this is nowhere close to what I am right now. And uh, I can't even say the words with a straight face. It's like, this is not plausible. Uh, and, and so, it, anyway, I, it's a cool exercise because you should be able to see for yourself what do you think you're off on and then someone else, you know, it's important for us to know what other people feel like we're off on as well, particularly significant others. So the homework challenge is if you just did that for each other and there seemed like a gap or an awkward off that you're like, oh, okay, um, why is that? And then what is it, what would be required for that to be a more straight-faced read? Like what would it take for your significant other, your friend, or whoever was your parents, whoever it was that was reading it to you, what would it take for that to change to be like, yeah, I can, I can say that, I, I, I'll buy that. And so whatever that is, is that something you feel like you can tackle in your life? So anyway, figure out what, what that is and then uh, you know, ask God, talk to God about how, because it's his will for us to be this way. And so a ask him, hey, wh what's got to change and how can I participate in changing it? All right, so we'll briefly go through, uh, we'll go through each of these. I'm just going to give a, a quick, two, you know, a couple words on each uh, aspect of love and then maybe a sign that we, we get off on it. So uh, love is patient, means it can endure provocation. So can, you, can we endure provocation? It preserves peace. When we are patient uh, and we're continue, peace is important and it's continually said, hey guys, maintain peace to the extent that's in your ability. This is how to do it. Love is patient. It keeps things peaceful. Love is kind. Kind, at least what I had here, was a, a mindful attention to others, putting others first. And for me, what I thought of first is when I'm hungry, and there's four or five people kind of racing for the food at the table sort of thing. Are, are we kind? Can we put someone else before us? It's like, hey, you're going to serve someone else. Anyway, that's just a reminder. Is that easy for you, or do you're like, ah, i got to get in mine? You know. Um, envy. Are we content? Envy is interesting. Uh, are we able to rejoice when others succeed? It seems like we should be able to. But this is hard. So, like, if, if your boss or someone else... You, you don't know if they should be getting it. If they get that job, you know, good for them. And they got, is that easy to do? Or is it kind of like, oh, that guy. Uh, you know, if somebody gets married and you want to be married, is it, you know, like, yeah, congrats. You're able to pull that off. And I couldn't. And, um, or Facebook, right? You know, everyone always, um, everybody posts what's going on that's good. They're like, oh, we're in the Himalayas for the third time this year. Look, you know, and they're, Zip lining from one mountain to another, and you're like, gosh. So it makes it. Can can you see that without envying, or can, is it easy for you to say, hey, good for them, glad for them. I'm hoping for your best. I'm excited for you. Boasting. So boast. Uh, if you've got something cool or big going on, do you have to let others know about it really quickly? Might be an indication that we're we're, we're boastful. Like you got an itchy trigger finger on social media. It's like, oh, I got to get it. I got to post this. Or is it like, you know, it, it, is, is it not a big deal to you? Like, man, this is just great. Uh, arrogance. Heck, if you hear somebody talking, that you're, 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 you've had ex personal experience in or you're, you've researched it and you're really, really good at whatever this topic is and that topic comes into play. Do you feel compelled to jump into that conversation and say, wait, 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 you got to hear what I heard, what I said, about, what I know about this subject. These might be indicators that we're, uh, we're arrogant and we want to hop in there and let everybody know what we're thinking and we're, we're knowledgeable on that topic. Again, these are just self. We're, we're elevating self. It doesn't matter. You know, let it roll. You can, you know, if they ask you, we can, they can ask us, but we don't have to hop in there and remind everybody that we're, a, you know, five-star general on whatever that topic is. This is one for me I always struggle with is like insisting on your own way. And so like, I have to have my way. If things aren't going to go my way, I start to get a little grumpy or, you know, whatever. I'm just going to kind of pout. So if things don't go your way, can you still have a good day? Irritable. Are you provoked? How hard is it to ruin your day? So would your, would your significant other or spouse say, hey, when... He's fine or she's fine until the first thing happens and then the whole day is ruined. Or this person's irritable. Resentful, just, you know, letting it go. And then the last four, 
Oh, I didn't get rejoice. Rejoice in wrongdoing and rejoicing uh, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Sometimes rejoicing in wrongdoing, you see something bad happen to someone else, and you're kind of like, ah, they had that coming, you know, and kind of be like, yeah, get them. It's time that that guy got fired. It's time that that guy got, you know, hurt, cooked, you hit it coming. That's not, that's us rejoicing in wrongdoing. Lo that's not loving. We're not supposed to do that. It may even be right. The guy may have had it coming. But you got, we got to check our hearts. We can't just be like, yeah. Um, rejoice in the truth. We rejoice in the truth. Last four, I kind of put all in a group that I remember, and I think of it whenever I'm thinking of my marriage and other people, uh, is that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We did like a counseling run through, and one of the first things you're supposed to do is provide hope. And love hopes all things. And so when things feel impossible, and usually whenever you're talking to someone in a counseling mindset, it's like they're on the last, it's on death, life support sort of thing oftentimes. And it's super, super important if someone's coming in that mindset to be like, no, here, this is what God said. This is what God promised. This is the reality of the situation. God wants this and there's nothing God is not capable of doing. This is what a good picture looks like of if things were to be going God's way. I'm going to hope for that. I'm going to believe in that. And I think we should be bearing through that together to achieve that. And so this is one of the first things you do to get somebody uh, excited about what God wants and what God's will is for them in that situation. And so, uh, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So for situations you feel like are just impossible, we need to be reminding ourselves that no, this is what love does. Love never fails. And so, uh, the last thing I wanna try to pull apart is like, what's the difference like, we know unbelievers that do this stuff, right? Do you know an unbeliever that's patient, that's kind? Well, yeah. And so, like, how... I don't know about you guys, but whenever... Particularly early on in my faith, I would see a really well-put-together family, we'll just say a, a Mormon family, that they, they, the divorce rate's better, and they're, the kids are doing better, and they're better with their money in a lot of ways than just typically... Just, like, statistical. I'm not being... That's just how it is. So like, you'll see this, and they seem to be put together pretty well. And then, but, but you know that in their heart, if they haven't yielded themselves to Christ, they're, we're headed towards hell if we don't have Christ. And so, like, how is it that they can seem to exhibit a lot of these qualities, but, like, they're still going to hell? And then on the flip side, we well, guys have been to Providence. We've got people who come in, and we've just got messy, chaotic lives. But we, we esteem that and say, hey, no, God is working. It's God's love. And so you'll, you'll see kind of uh, similar maybe to a lesser degree these. Uh, so what, what differentiates the two? Does it bother you at all that will we'll, we'll kind of incriminate that and say, well, no, God's not pleased with that, even though they're doing them theoretically better. But he is pleased with this mess over here because he's working on them. So that, that felt inconsistent to me early on. And I just, I was trying to figure out when I was going through this chapter, okay, how do I, how do we, how do you tell the difference between two? Because they look really similar. They're similar in that worldly, worldly love and godly love have concern towards others. So you'll, you'll still see people have concern towards each other. It'll focus on needs. There'll be a desire for well-being and fulfillment. Like these things are happening with both Christian and worldly love. But, uh, but, but to separate the two, I think it's real important that we have a good definition of love. And I tried to put it this way. The grand summary is, is Christian love is God-focused and worldly love is man-focused. So even though it looks really pretty and put together, the focus of it is, is, is man. And, and I'm going to give a few verses just to try to show that contrast. I think that they're different in the way they're initiated, the way they're motivated, the way they're applied, and then the benefit. So a verse is uh, our tendency is to think that, well, we decided to love God or we decided to love. And we're reminded 1 John 4, 10 says, this is love, not that we loved him first, but, but what? That he loved us. And so like the origination of love for the Christian is that Christ first loved us and died for us. That's what love is because that's, what, that's what's defined in the Bible. Whereas man says, hey, I saw this person over here. They're in need. I felt I'm going to go try to take care of that. I loved first. No, God says God loves first. The motivation, there's another verse, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. That's why we love. We love and the purpose of our love is, uh, the motivation for it is because he first loved us and so boom, we're going to go, 
we're going to do that. Whereas it's a dependent thing. We depend on God because he loves us first, then we can go love. The world loves, it's independent. They decided, I decided I'm going to love. It's going to bring karma to me. I'm going to do well. My conscience tells me I should love or else I'll feel guilt. Uh, or I'm trying to be really good for God. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to justify myself and be good enough before God. But that's not, that's you deciding to do it. That's not because he first loved us. The application of it is different. John 13, 34, he says, you should love just as I have loved you. So he took off, remember he washed the disciples' feet, say, love one another, serve one another, same way I'm loving you. And then, uh, you know, whereas uh, an unbeliever will just love in whatever makes sense to them. It's like, oh, well, I felt like this should happen this way, so they're going to love that way. And then finally, Godly love, the purpose, the benefit is different. In uh, Sermon on the Mount, it says, we're going to love one another so that others may see our good works and do what? Give glory to God in heaven. Whereas the, the you know, world and the love's like, well, I, felt, I wanted to meet this need, and so that person's need was met. So anyway, sorry for that length, but that, I, I was trying to, that's, how I, that's what I came up with, is so how we can see love occurring in two different places but one glorifies God and is rooted in God, is in the strength of God, and the other is just in man and what man wants to do on his own. So I hope we can tell the difference. I think it's super important because you're not special just because somebody says you're special. And you're not special because a Victoria's Secret shirt says love on it and tells, tells you you're special. You're not even special because you said you're special a whole lot to yourself 20 times. You're special because God made you special. And he said it in his word, and he loves you. That's how you're special, is he loved for you, and that's the definition of love. And that's what we need to be clinging to, and telling others as well. So, um, anyway, that's the, the last part we're not even going to get to, just because I, I knew I wouldn't have time for it. But it, it, it's basically that love is superior and permanent. And so the last part of that uh, says that um, right now we see dimly as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we will know fully, even as he's fully, as we are fully known. So to the extent that God knows us, we will know fully. Uh, and I can't dive into all the application of that, but God knows how many hairs are on my balding head. And he knows me really well, and I will know as fully as that. He sees we, we will. We, the, back then, they had mirrors that weren't perfect. They had just polished metal. So the point was, is you can't see very well in a in a mirror. Period. And then uh, now, now it won't even be a reflection. So you see them face to face. So anyway, I take peace in knowing that I don't have to have all these things all figured out right now. And I think we should all take peace in knowing that we don't have to have everything figured out right now. And there'll be a day when we will have it all figured out. So there's probably more to that than uh, than I have time to go into. But uh, but that's the takeaway from the last verses. So uh, with that, I think what I'll do is just uh, pray for us, if that's okay. And then uh, Abraham, we can continue the worship.